I just talked with a CEO of a large company who said, if I'm feeling comfortable, I suspect something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Something has to be wrong. Yeah. I think there always needs to be that level of discomfort because that means you're pushing things, you know, whether it's your company, your programs, your own, yourself personally. And so people, well, why? Why do you want to do that? And I think the more you do that, and, and pushing your comfort zone, in my mind, is taking risks. And it's not like, yeah, I'm going to jump off a cliff and hope, you know, I have my parachute. It's really calculated risks that you're trying to take. And I think what that does is it really builds confidence that, hey, I can do it. I can talk to Leslie on TV and, and everything was good and I didn't die. And all of those culmination of experiences, I think, gives you the confidence to move forward and do other things in the future. It, it gave me the confidence to move from one industry to another industry. It gave me the confidence to take risks that you know others may not have taken and and know that it's not going to be the end of the world if it if it fails because I'm building a skill set that I can then transfer to something else. Susan Yamada's confidence has taken her from playing football in the streets of Kaneohe to leading tech companies during the dot-com boom. Even with her crazy work hours and success on the West Coast, she never lost sight of home. Susan Yamada next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Susan Yamada, raised in Windward, Oahu, was an accidental entrepreneur who did very well in the Silicon Valley dot-com industry. She was so successful that when she returned to Hawaii to raise her children, she didn't ever have to work for pay again. Yet she does. Today, Yamada is the executive director of PACE, that's the Pacific Asian Center for Entrepreneurship, within the Scheidler College of Business at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She's mentoring Hawaii's future entrepreneurs. Yamada grew up in Kaneohe, where she realized at a young age that she loved to compete. Tell me about your family. Kind of a uh, Rockwellian childhood, you know, my, my dad had his own business uh, selling plywood in town on, uh, in Kalihi. Um, my mom is a school teacher, so she taught at kindergarten at Heia Elementary School. And um, I have two brothers, one older than me, two years, and one younger than I am. So you're the only girl and you're the middle child. Yes. What, does that say anything about you? Um, hmm. I think that's a good question. I think it says a lot about me in that um, I grew up playing more baseball than, than with dolls. I remember one uh, Christmas I got a hair dryer and that turned into a nice little pistol. Um, so, yeah. And you're athletic. I love athletics. Growing up, we played in the neighborhood, right? Baseball, football, with all the neighborhood kids. So, yeah, I love sports. Did you play in the street? Oh yeah, in the street. <laughs> and, and the cars had to wait a little bit until you could get off. Luckily, the road. we lived on a dead end. But you know, every time the the ball went into the like the mean neighbor's house, you know, everybody ran away, and <laughs> whoever hit the ball into that yard had to go get it, right? So it was just kind of like that. Okay, pass the telephone pole. That's a touchdown. Okay, and then this manhole cover. That's home home plate. So it was really cool. Well, that's interesting that you were uh, <laughs> an athlete and uh, a tomboy. So um, that does that mean? Um, competition might have been easier for you when you hit the business world because mm. in those days women were still yeah that's interesting and I think my my competitiveness helped me uh, I don't like to lose you know I like to set my goals and and achieve them but I think when I set out on my business career that really wasn't kind of foremost in my mind what was high school like for you I mean Public high school in Hawaii. Yeah, so everyone has some fun memories, or yeah, maybe it, not it so was fun. a lot of fun. Um, you know, I went to public schools all the way up to Castle, and so some kids you knew, and then you know more kids as you go to King, and that's when I don't know. There's like four or five elementary schools in the Kaneohe area that all matriculate to King Intermediate, and so I got to know a lot more more friends at at King Intermediate, and then we all went up to to Castle, and. Um, you know, I've just met a ton of friends, and we remain friends to this day. You know, every Christmas we have a, a, a gathering, and we get together, and we just laugh and laugh. Did your parents explicitly tell you about life? Did they give you advice, or was it uh, leading by example? <laughs> yeah, well, 
um, career-wise anyway, my mom gave me advice and she said, be a school teacher because school teachers, you get the summer off, all the holidays, when your kids are off, you'll be off too. Um, so from that point, I, didn't re I wasn't a really good listener. But you know, I think the fundamental values that, that they exhibited themselves about being hardworking, being honest, uh, being a contributing member of society, uh, they totally led by example. And, and I feel that that's the foundation for my life. And on that, you grow, you know, who you are, what you become, and things like that. Your father owned his own business mm -hmm. and then sold it, right? Yes. Yeah, so that was great because growing up in elementary school, he had his own business, and, uh, and on weekends, he'd let one or two of us uh, come over to, to his, and it was a pretty small uh, place. And, you know, we'd just kind of be messing around with, and, and he had a, a plywood business as well as some hardware supplies. And so all the scrap wood, we'd just be building stuff, and sometimes he'd tell us to clean out the hardware area, so we'd do that. Also, we could have like this Boulevard Simon plate lunch for lunch and, and that was like the best Saturday was to be able to go with dad to work. When you were raised, I, I imagine your parents really weren't giving you water bottles and um, we and, drank and from the hose. <laughs> we drank from the hose. And then telling you don't come back till, I bet you they said don't come back till dusk or, or yeah, yeah. yeah. How did you raise your kids differently? Uh, you know, than that? it's very different, and, and and it's unfortunate, really. I mean, when I was growing up, it was like you know, you you had something to eat for breakfast. You were out. You're playing all day. When you got hungry, you know, you came home. You made yourself a sandwich. You went back out again, and you had to come home when you saw Dad's car coming down the 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 road because. You're either gonna to have to do yard work or dinner's gonna be ready soon. And so we had so much freedom, you know? We'd get on our bikes, we'd ride down to the river, catch 50 fish, put them all in an aquarium and try to name them all. I mean, it's crazy, right? And, I, you know, I'm, I'm sad for my kids that they couldn't have that level of freedom at that young age well, anymore. why couldn't they? You know, I don't know how much is reality and how much is perception in parenting at this point where, you know, even if my kids, when they were in elementary school, were playing in the front yard, I felt like I had to be out in the front watching. If there's even a minuscule chance that your kid's gonna get abducted, then of course you're gonna be out front and you're gonna be watching, but it's just a different world. And because, you know, our neighborhood wasn't full of kids, it, you know, you'd have to have play dates. You'd have to invite kids over to, to play with them. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about helicopter parents, you know, I don't think I am one, but you are, when your kids are young, kind of setting their life up. It's, it's less creative for them, I think, at this point. You know, that's where I think some of the old charm, I guess, of Hawaii is being lost. And I was just commenting to my friends, I go, I know I'm getting old because I'm grumbling a lot now about how it used to be and how it is now and how it's, you know, losing some of that kind of that ohana, that inclusive community sometimes. After Susan Yamada earned a bachelor's degree in business administration at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, she went into the hotel industry. Eventually, her love of the ocean led her to greater opportunities. I learned some interesting things that they don't teach you at the Travel Industry Management School, and that's when you work at a hotel chain, if you want to move up, many times you have to transfer out of um, you know one hotel into another. And at the time, I know it's hard to believe, but there was just one Marriott in the state, and that was on Maui. That was their first uh, Marriott that they built. And so I was there, and then I found out I would have to travel. So my big goal in life after the university was to move to Maui. Why? Because my cousins were there, and we just spent all my summers there, and mm. I just loved the lifestyle there. It's just so laid back. Um, but I found that, you know, being single and in my 20s, after about two and a half years, it was just a really small place. Mm -hmm. And so it was time for my uh, promotion, or I was up for promotion, and so they asked if I wanted to um, either go to, I think it was Torrance or Santa Clara. So I got out the map, because to that point, I had been out of state once, and I, had, I, I went on my second trip right before I, I, I moved, but I knew nothing, right? So I looked to see what, what the proximity of those two areas was to the beach. So <laughs> Santa Clara looked much closer. So I chose Santa Clara. And little did I know that Santa Clara is Silicon Valley. So that was 
a good move on my part, but I can't say that I planned that. <laughs> and you had the beach. Yeah. <laughs> but but, but you know, you're going there to work in the hotel industry, not to work in Silicon yes. Valley. Yes. Uh huh. And and so that's what I thought. It was just the next step. I would go there, spend two years there, and then I would come back home. And uh, so I got there, and um, I just. It, and this is why I feel a lot of local kids, they should really get out because it's such a big world. You know, I thought tourism, hey, being from Hawaii, wanting to stay in Hawaii, that's where my career opportunities were gonna be. And when I got to Silicon Valley, it was just like, oh my gosh, it was just, you know, drinking from fire hose, there were so many different opportunities. So I went, I got my MBA after two and a half years uh, at the Santa Clara Marriott, and then I got into the technology industry. Susan Yamada left the hotel industry to pursue work that would give her experience in running a business. She got an opportunity to test her skills when she was offered a job at Upside Magazine, a publication that was on the cutting edge of the digital revolution and groundbreaking in its time. What did you do in those years between your wow. MBA and, and that? Okay, so I was a research analyst for the technology industry for a couple years and I worked in a head injury rehab um, organization doing the business side of it. My father-in-law had a contact with um, a magazine publisher and he said, I've got a failing magazine that needs to get turned around and I'm looking for somebody to run it. And so I think maybe it was four years out of my MBA, my father-in-law introduced me to this guy and that's how I got my first opportunity to run a company and well, it was a failing company. What was that transition like? The one thing that I learned and, and you know, is business is business no matter what you're hawking. Um, so whether you're in the hotel business or whether, you know, I, w I, w I was a consultant soon after, uh, researcher and analyst, you know, you have a product and you need to sell it. And so that, I think, was one of the first lessons that I had of, okay, how do you make money? You know, what is my business and, and how do you make money? So you go from head injuries and research and uh, analysis to magazine publishing. Yes. Of course, that is in the middle of, at that time, of a digital revolution. Right. So the internet was just starting to, to come out and be a big player. And so the magazine that we had, I mean, and again, it's hard to believe, but there was no Wired. There was no, uh, when you picked up Business Week, they didn't have an extensive uh, editorial about the technology industry. Technology industry was just starting to come out. The PC was just kind of transforming all kinds of things. We're trying to figure out all the different things PCs could do. Um, so our magazine really focused on those sorts of needs, but to a higher level audience. So there were executives within the technology industry that wanted to know what other people were doing because the future of technology was still unlimited. So did that put you in touch with the titans of technology? Yeah. yeah. So every, every month we would have an interview with one of the leaders in the technology industry, whether it was Bill Gates or Larry Ellison. It, it was just an incredible time to be in, and I'm not sure it would be so easy to get those interviews today, but at during that time, you know, it, most definitely. And did you think that was your calling, magazines? I loved it, yeah. It wasn't so much magazines as it was, I loved the fact that you never knew if you were gonna make payroll. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know, and people were, people were like, that that would drive me nuts and you know obviously it wasn't just like wishing you actually put together a plan and started implementing the plan but when things start working it's so exciting to see that Susan Yamada was the publisher of Upside Magazine for five and a half years. During that time, the magazine became profitable, and the connections she made there opened doors to new opportunities in the digital revolution. That's when the internet was starting to take off, and that was a super exciting time. It was like being the, the second coming of the gold rush in California, because there's so much excitement in the Bay Area. People were flocking to the Bay Area to take part in this, you know, this internet mania. Um, you know, if you graduated from college with a bachelor's degree and you were halfway, you know, decent. You're making six figures already. It took me all my career for, to that point to get up to that point. And here these, these kids are, and just because there was such a shortage of talent, they were making incredible money. There was so much money going, on, going around in the Bay Area at that time. And so what did you do? What was your next step? I joined a 
internet startup company called Trusty. And if you look at a lot of the major uh, websites now, they all have privacy statements and many of them have a trustee seal. And it was an interesting time because the internet was so new, uh, privacy was an issue. Privacy of your personal information, your name, your address, your phone number. Um, because the internet is a global marketplace. And unlike the United States, the European Union considers your personal information yours. In the United States, any information you give, that's a database for somebody to sell. And we used to sell that database extensively when I was at Upside. Now we're dealing with the fact of having to train US websites that they have to state what they're using the information they're collecting it for, and they have to do it. Your company came up with that um, yeah, limitation? Right, right. And trustee is still working, still, there. still operational? Yeah. Wow, so did what happened to your time there? Because you, clearly you don't do that anymore. You know, the first time a big site came in, like the first time Yahoo said they were gonna use our seal, you know, the crowd goes wild, right? But you know, when Microsoft comes in, it's like, mm, all right. Then when, you know, Netscape was really big at that time came in, it's just so anticlimactic already. It's like you're expecting it to happen. And I, I don't know, for me, it just kind of gets boring really. So. I just find 18 to 24 months, it's time to move on. Now, it seems to me that at that time, there were very few women, probably very few Asian women, mm -hmm. very few Asians, period. Yeah. What was that like for you? My married name was Scott, so it was Susan Scott. And when I would make an appointment to, to see people, they were expecting Susan Scott, right? And so I think first impressions are very important. And I think if I went in on the mainland as Susan Yamada, there would be a ton of stereotypes. I don't know, I think it's just human nature. Um, but right in that little time when they're like looking around in the waiting room for the Susan. Where's the blonde? Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. A tall, statuesque, blonde woman, right? Isn't that what you would think? And so right in that moment of confusion, it was my, my time to make a good impression. So. You know, that's when I would just be, you know, very forthright and go, hi, I'm, you know, Sus and just try and break any stereotype they may have had ab about me already. So I, I use that as one specific example. But the one thing that I felt about the technology industry is for the most part is gender, gender neutral. It's like, what can you help me with? And if you have the skill sets, I don't think, gen I never felt like gender was a big, big issue. But you did have to get in the door. Totally, yeah. Susan Yamada moved back to Hawaii in 2001. She had made enough money to retire and she spent her time raising her children and volunteering in the community. Over time, plans changed and in 2008, Yamada started working part-time at the Pacific Asian Center for Entrepreneurship in the Scheidler College of Business at the UH. That turned into a full-time role. The job with Scheidler, I mean, it's not something I have to do but it's something that I've come to love to do. And, and part of it is a bigger issue of um, being able to give back to Hawaii. I mean, it, it's been fantastic for me. It's, it's where my roots are, I love it here. The 17 years I was in Silicon Valley, you know, my main purpose was a goal that, that, that took me too long to attain, because as I told you before, it was just supposed to be two years that I was up there was to come back because this is my home. And so having the opportunity to be able to give back to my community through the university, because I'm very passionate about education, uh, it's an honor for me to do that. So yeah, I could be messing around and playing golf all day, but I don't think I'd get the same level of fulfillment. In your opinion, what are uh, the things that drive entrepreneurs? I mean, are they, are they very different and you can't generalize or, or do they tend to be hardwired in a certain way? I think there are certain characteristics that make a successful entrepreneur. Number one is they have to have a vision and drive and they can't be easily dissuaded. You know, so you talk about entrepreneurship and passion a lot. And I think a big part of that is uh, passion is, is, is very important. You need to be able to really believe that what you're providing will be a significant improvement to your life, whoever your buyer is. And the, the first year, the first two years, the first five years, very, very difficult. And you have to work really hard. So I think the work ethic and a passion are two things that we always look for. And then there's a coachability standpoint. It seems like such a tough deal where a, an entrepreneur has to be able to 
persevere despite rejection and hard times, and yet has to know when they're hearing advice mm -hmm. that they really should take and, and leave it, do something else. Exactly. I, I mean, it is not, it is not easy uh, for sure, but it is something that almost every single startup will go through at some point. Have you ever been wrong in saying, that's not gonna work, don't do it? Yeah, rarely do I say that, because you know what, if I was that smart, I would be, I don't know, <laughs> sitting on a beach right now, right? <laughs> but, but, <clears throat> Because you never know, right? So you, what do you say? If they wanted to, to, to open a restaurant, for example, serving hamburgers in Waikiki, the first question I would ask is, how are you different mm -hmm. from these 10 other competitors that are so within one mile? So you ask probing questions yeah. so that they make their own right. conclusions. Now, if you are different, right, if you're a Korean-style taco truck, for example, who's, which is wildly uh, successful in LA, okay, maybe that's enough of a difference, right? If you have a social media campaign, I need to see different. I can't see the same. Because if you're copying the same thing, it's very, very, very tough. A goal is hard work. And if you're easily dissuaded from your idea or you don't have that passion or perseverance, it's not gonna happen. And how do people even support themselves for four or five ideas while so, they're just refining yeah, this? Yeah, so that's what I tell my students. I go, if you ever have entrepreneurial um, aspirations, do it now. You don't have kids, you don't have, you don't have to pay you know, for tuitions, you don't have to pay a mortgage or your car loan. I said, you have the least to lose right now, so do it now. But whoever doesn't have that when they're an adult? And that's where it gets much harder, mm -hmm. but it is possible. So, you know, I was an adult, when I started my my business, um, it, so it's possible you can do it. You just have to be able to manage your what resources you have. And yet, Susan Yamada credits her time away from Hawaii for challenging her to grow in ways that she may not have if she'd stayed home. If people could have seen you in Silicon Valley at the time they were working at their jobs in Honolulu, would you have had a markedly different style from your style now? I think my, I'm more forward and I, I'm less concerned about what people think about what I say. So maybe less filter. And, and I think part of that has to do with you know where I am today or who I am today and not being overly concerned about, am I gonna get a promotion or what are people gonna think about me? I mean, they can think whatever they wanna think, actually. It's just who I am, it's, it's what my opinion is, and we can agree to disagree, and I'm perfectly happy with that. I don't have to win an argument. Um, so I think you know it has changed me. I think it's given me more confidence to say what I wanna say and um, just be who, who I am and not try to be someone that someone else wants me to be. Do you recall being that way before? I think when you're younger, you're a lot more insecure, and so you know you take everything to to heart as far as and and maybe you create um, self perception issues that might not even be there. But I think the great thing about getting older is, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am who I am, and and you know I try to be a good person, and so I let I try and let that guide me. I have mentors for everything, right? I, for how do I raise my kids, to you know, business mentors, to um, you know, my friends from high school, right? They they all form this this very informal kitchen cabinet, if you will, and so that I can call them and and share different things with them and get feedback. And do they always agree? Oh, I don't want them to agree with so me. So you just want to hear some how, how right. you handle this right. and then you decide because what you do. Because I don't want them to tell me what to do. I want them to give me their opinion. Mm -hmm. And because they don't know what, what specifically I'm going through. And so you take their opinion and you make your own decision based on that. But it, you, you never said formally to any of them, would you be willing to be part of my kitchen cabinet? No, no. <laughs> how did that evolve? I just make them. <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? Professionally, uh, the magazine. Um, so I had, I, we brought in the, the chairman of the board who wanted, the guy who hired me, he eventually wanted the job back after it was profitable. And so I did conferences, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get back into a startup routine. And you know, we weren't really quite seeing eye to eye on things. And uh, I came home from a, from a conference and there was a envelope on my front door and it was a termination letter. And so it's like he didn't even have the courtesy to call me. 
you know, it was something he gave me, uh, something that wasn't successful. I was able to turn it around and I was like, how can this happen? How can the board allow something like that to happen? So that professionally was probably the worst thing that ever happened to me. Didn't the magazine later go into bankruptcy? Mm. How long after that? I think they, they expanded too quickly into the internet and they put mm. too many resources there and they were undercapitalized and so it didn't work out. So I think within the three years after that, it was pretty much on mm. the ropes and down. But that is quite the, quite the rejection, isn't it? Especially after you've put so much into yeah, it. Yeah, after five years into it, right? So yeah, that was, and I didn't think it was very well done either. Since you've headed the um, a pace, mm. what's the best thing that's come out of it? I don't think it would be a specific business idea. It's the students that come out of there. You know, I see them going in and I see them experiencing the joy of discovery of the aha moments, like, ah, oh, I get it. Okay, I've got to do this and this. And they're, you know, they're students, they're so eager to please. They really want to do a good job. And when I see them working hard, when I see things coming together for them, I'm super excited for them. Because what I think I'm doing is I'm teaching them life lessons. Susan Yamada is inspiring and challenging new generations of entrepreneurs through her passion and perseverance, qualities that continue to guide her own life. Mahalo to Susan Yamada of Honolulu for her enthusiasm and her commitment to serving our community. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahuiho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. Do you see yourself making another change in the future? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, my son is in ninth grade now, and I've always said that, and it should be no shock to my boss. Um, that once my son is out, of, out into college, then I think that opens up a whole nother chapter in my life as far as what do I do next.